everyone talks about working with students, but I spend my day working with teachers. And so I'm really here to talk to you about my work at the American Museum of Natural History. I work in science education, which means I spend my time thinking about how to support teachers to be more effective with you, students in the classroom. So the museum is just a few streets down, and here I am working at the museum. You can see I work inside and outside. So one of my favorite questions when I work with teachers is this question. How do you like to learn? I ask hundreds of teachers this question. And the reason why I ask this question is because I want them to think about really how they like to learn and also how they see themselves as learners. So I just propose that question to all of you in the audience. Just think about how you like to learn. And I'm going to share with you some of their results. So teachers generally are like most of you in this room. They love to learn hands-on. They love to use technology. They love visual learning. They love watching TV and video. And they love learning from experts. And most teachers will say, I need time to think about what I'm learning. So this is kind of generally initial response. And here's some teachers here I worked with a couple years ago on the Bronx River, taking them canoeing down the Bronx River to learn about the river and the ecology of the river. But when I ask them a little bit more in depth to think about this question, this is what they say. Because I really want them to think about how they like to learn. And they'll say solving a problem. And we heard a lot of people talking about problems today and their work. Asking questions. Being able to choose what I'm going to learn. Having choice. Talking with others. Having time to explore. Not being so rushed with the learning and feeling safe and comfortable. And all of you know that that is so important for learning. Here's some teachers at the Natural History Museum doing an activity that many of you probably wouldn't think teachers would enjoy, but actually really did enjoy, which is digging for fossils in a, in a fossil pit in our, one of our exhibits. So this is how they like to learn. And then what I say is, do you give these experiences to your students in the classroom? I just want to share two ways I like to learn, because I think most of you in this room will relate to this. I play a lot of ping pong. I started when I was nine. I still play. I almost play every single day. And I swim. And I swim not every day, but pro almost. And these are two things that, when I think about how I like to learn, I could not have learned these two things without actually doing them. If you had talked to me and said, this is how you put spin on a ball, this is how you swim, I wouldn't have learned those things. And I learned them doing them. And now, 40 years, 40 plus years later, I can say I've ex I'm almost an expert in these two things. I'm still working on them, but I love doing them. So I encourage you in the room, if you like learning by doing and you have your passions, to focus on them. And remember, that's an amazing way to learn. And you have that opportunity. And so these are the learning styles teachers like. They like solving a problem, asking questions, time to explore, freedom to choose, and talking with others. And that really connects really well with what I heard today, with the scientific process. And it kind of aligns really nicely with looking at a question, answering a problem, investigating, collecting, analyzing, and investigating further. Very few teachers have reflected on this question. It's just interesting how many of us have never think about this question, how do you like to learn? And then even few really ask their students, how do you like to learn? And the responses, though, of what teachers tell me and what we know is really consistent with how people learn and also what's effective for science teaching. Here's a teacher, one of my favorite teachers uh, that I've worked with a lot, Anthony, uh, doing some work in a lab with us. So this shouldn't be news for many of you and the teachers in the room, but there's the key findings on learning kind of substantiate this, which is that we all enter learning environments with prior knowledge. We all come to things knowing something before we learn it, and it's really important to activate that before you get there. And we all know to learn deeply about something that you need to have the factual information, but you also need a, more of a foundation in the conceptual framework of that learning. And many of the projects today talked about that. You learn the facts, but you also learn the science concepts behind those facts. And that's really important. And the final one is having time to reflect on your learning. So those are three things that are really important for learning to happen. I want to share an example of just when I first started teaching, 
which was teaching out of context. And so many of you today gave me so much great examples of teaching in context. All of you should be familiar with this as a water sampling kit. I would always try and teach the kids about pH and what it meant. And I never really thought that my students understood this. Because I would take out the kit and we'd do it in the classroom. And it was my first year of teaching and my principal said to me, Christina, you know, you should know, you can do anything with the students. You can take them out of the classroom. And I knew this. I worked a lot with people outside of classrooms before in my past career. But I didn't know I could really do this with students. And it really was an eye opener because I then started taking students out of the classroom. And I started teaching the content in context. And here are some students. I worked at a school called Humanities Preparatory Academy. And these are high school students um, on the Hudson River in, in Chelsea, in the first picture, doing some water testing work. So many of you talked about collecting data and looking at pH and nitrogen. And we were doing this on the Hudson River. And then also here on the clear water, sailing down the Hudson, and then also dissecting a striped bass, which is one of the fish that you'd find in the Hudson. So I told you my job is to work with teachers. So how do I support teachers to do this more? That's really where I spend my time with, so they can give you better learning experiences at school. How do I support teachers to connect and inspire students to connect science to everyday life? Here are some teachers at the museum working, looking at some skulls in a lab we did with them, doing some research on the computers, and also looking at some collections. So we always talk about strategies in teaching. So what are these strategies? You want it to be inquiry-based. You want it to be project-based, which many of you talked about today. You want to directly observe nature. Look at real data in science. You want to tell stories. You want to problem solve. You want to experience the learning in content. And you want to problem solve local and global challenges. And if you have an opportunity to learn outside, that's fantastic. And you want to try and connect to relevant stories to students' lives. The one I want to focus on today is storytelling, because telling stories is really important. And I want to engage you a little bit in a story. But before I do that, I want to just tell you what teachers tell me, what makes a good story. This is what they would tell me, that it has a beginning, a middle, well-written, it's factual, it's climatic, and there's characters. That's what science teachers usually tell me when I ask them this question. And I want them to think a little bit deeper about what makes a good story a good story. If I was to ask this question to English teachers or social studies teachers, they would give me these kind of responses. Good stories have compelling characters. They have a sense of place. There's a problem, a conflict, a struggle, a hero, a villain, a change, a journey. So those are good stories. So how do I help teachers tell those good stories in science? So one story I want to tell you about today is about a fish. And this fish has lived an enormously long time on this planet. It's one of the oldest fishes on the planet today, and one of the last ones of its type. And this fish can live up to 100 years old. And it's an amazing fish. It can grow up to almost 50 to 100 feet. It lives in the northern hemisphere. And this fish, some of you might be familiar with, is called a sturgeon. It's got these old scuts on the top here, these plates. It's got barbells and whiskers. And everyone wants this fish. Poachers want this fish. And, and others want this fish. They want it for its, the meat, but they really want it for its eggs. This fish produces an amazing, amazing eggs. And when it lays eggs, and it doesn't do it often, people want them. And it's called caviar. And this fish lives in the Caspian Sea. And just to show you a can of what the caviar comes in, this is about 500 grams, OK? Half a pound. Guess what people would pay for this? 500 grams of fish eggs, between three to $5,000. Three to 5000 And you might wonder, who eats this? It's not me. It's not anyone in this room. Who eats this and who can afford this? Oh, I love that hands go up. That's good. OK. $5,000. And this fish is, has to be killed to get those eggs. And they slice this fish open right in the middle, down the center. And they take the eggs out. When the fish is not even dead, they kind of take a big club and hit it over the head. 
And so it's stunned, it's not dead, because they want the eggs nice and fresh, and they take the eggs out. It takes 18 to 23 years for this fish to even reproduce, for the females to be mature enough to reproduce. It's a long time. And it doesn't reproduce often. So it's got a couple of things not going well for it. People want the fish, the fish eggs, they'll pay a lot of money. This fish is banned in the United States since 2005. So you cannot get this fish, but guess what? It still comes in. Here at the museum, one of our scientists, Rob DeSalle, with others, developed a technique to use DNA to take the DNA out of the caviar eggs to identify what fish it's from. Because all living things have DNA, and so they can identify the fish. So then, they can go around and test caviar in the city and where they sell it to see if it comes from this fish. So this work was done at the museum. And so we're telling this story with teachers. Well, we're talking about DNA. So one of the first things we get teachers to do is to make a DNA, because this is complex, this is abstract, and we want them to learn how to do this for themselves, but also for their students. So here, you'll all enjoy this, because teachers have to make a DNA model. And this is their work, and they put it all on a table for me the day they made it. It's all made out of candy. You can see the ladder and how the bases are in the middle here. And they put them all on the table, and then they took the picture. And they wanted to show me, look, Christina, we did the work. And I was very proud of them. And here's a teacher for the first time ever learning how to micropipette and take the DNA and put it into this gel. Because you can't see DNA, so they have to put it into this gel. This is what it looks like when you visualize it. So this is a sturgeon species you're looking at here. But that's abstract. That doesn't make any sense or meaning for you. But it would if it had a picture with it. And we developed this class called Wildlife Forensics. So we want teachers to learn how to do this so they can do this with their students, which is identify DNA, looking at caviar eggs, and identify which species. So here are the steps to just going through identification. You're going to take some of the DNA out of the caviar, use a technique called PCR to amplify the DNA, and you're going to make a lot of copies of it. And then you're going to use these really interesting enzymes that cut the DNA in different pieces. And that's why I have the scissors here to show you. They're, sometimes people call them molecular scissors because they cut DNA. And then you're going to put the DNA into a gel and run the gel. And the gel will run different bands. So you're really making a fingerprint of the animal, of the sturgeon. And this is what you end up with, these pictures. These are all different pictures of DNA, of different sturgeon species. Because remember, there are seven sturgeon species in the Caspian Sea, and they're all very similar, but they're not the same. So how do you tell the difference when you're looking at caviar in a can? So here's one here, the beluga, in telling the story of the beluga and where it lives. And so it's not just looking at this picture here of the gel, but telling the whole story of this beluga. You can see the fishermen here catching it. This fish is now on the critical list, the beluga sturgeon. It is so highly endangered, it probably won't be around for very much longer. But many scientists think probably in the next 20 to 30 years it'll be completely extinct because of its eggs. Another one, the ceruga. They're all from the Caspian Sea. The white sturgeon is actually a species from North America. The ocetra, another very well-known species from the Caspian Sea. And finally, I wanted to share the Atlantic sturgeon with you because this one lives right here. We have two different species of sturgeon right here in the Hudson River, which you wouldn't think about. It's been around for a long time, and we want people to understand how important it is. It's ex extremely rare. This one here was found on the Hudson River here at 125th Street in 2008. It washed up. It's four feet long on the bottom, so you can see, they're still around, and they're still here in the Hudson, and they need our protection. Here, and then, when I was doing this project, someone sent me a picture in the mail and said, they didn't know what it was. They just sent it to me. They knew I was working on this uh, sturgeon work. And they sent this, and this was found at Coney Island on Brighton Beach. And you get a sense of, this is this person's hand, how big this one was as well. This was two years ago. Telling stories, and your stories today were really valuable to me. And my work here with teachers is to help them tell stories through science so that you can have a much more effective 
experience at school. Thank you.